Well, I'm just really happy to be here. The last time I was here was about three weeks before the whole, con- whole world locked down in COVID, three or four weeks. In fact, my claim to fame was I think I got COVID at the Royal Inn the last time I stayed there. Because as my, my health deteriorated as we went from one day to the next day, and I wasn't feeling the greatest. We had uh, meetings in, in the States, in Cincinnati, uh, it's about a week after I was here, and I wasn't feeling well, but I really wanted to go to those meetings, and they asked me the question at the airport before I got on the plane, have you been to China or Iran? And I said, no. So they let me on the plane. And as I was down there, I felt worse and worse and worse. And I started showing up all those symptoms. And as the, the nations were locking down, President Trump was on, on the TV and he was saying, we're gonna, we've already turned off people from China. We're going to stop people from coming from Europe. And my friend from the Bahamas was with me. He said, I'm getting on the next plane to go home because I never may get back. So that, he was planning to do his shopping in Miami because things are cheaper in Miami for people from Bahamas. And, and my friend always brings just one big suitcase with two other suitcases inside because he has to buy garden hoses and seeds and candy for his grandkids. And so he got on the next flight, uh, got down to Miami and got on the next flight at midnight. I had to wait a day. And uh, as I'm on the plane, I'm popping Benadryl and all sorts of stuff, so I look healthy. <laughs> and I was so sick by the time I got home. <clears throat> I'm not a carrier. I, I, I asked people afterwards that were at that conference, were you, anybody get sick? No. So I was okay. But it changed our world, didn't it? It changed our world. And... Uh, since then, I've had COVID at least one more time. We had a conference in Saskatoon, and we were giving each other's gifts, and we had 25 people show up with COVID a, a few days later. So there we are. And it's part of our culture now, isn't it? I'm really happy to be here. We had really good conversation yesterday about the future, the future here. And I'll thank you for everyone who participated. We're going to have some reporting, uh, some things put together, and I will share them with you. I'll send them to Pastor Bob, and he'll let everybody know what, what we were talking about. As my habit is today, every, every Sunday morning in Battleford and every place I go, I start off my message with a land acknowledgement. And luckily, I didn't have to change it for Edmonton because you're in the same territory. <laughs> As we gather here this morning as people, and I added this part to the land acknowledgement, that we are people who understand covenants and treaties. We acknowledge we are on Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis, and we pay our respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place, and we reaffirm our relationship with one another. And certainly that's why we're here, because we are developing relationships with each other, and with other people outside this room. Now, I have a question. Is somebody supposed to read the scripture, correct? So I'd like to call on Betty to read the scripture from Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. Does this work? Is it working? When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, 
Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king replied, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And they also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not to do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So how do you respond to those words, those words of Jesus? Well, today the church calls this Sunday, at the end of the, this, uh, this part of the year, because our new year is starting with Advent, the church calls this Sunday Christ the King Sunday, or the Reign of Christ Sunday. And this passage today is filled with both astonishment and judgment. Astonishment because the sheep, it says, didn't realize that they were serving Jesus when they cared for their brothers and sisters. And the goats didn't realize that by not doing so, they were ignoring Jesus. This passage always gets me thinking, particularly this year, some of the things I've gone to, through. And let me just give me a moment to speak to some of the things that have been on my mind lately. You know, as pastors or speakers, we get to speak sometimes from where we are. Maybe you do too when you're telling your stories. We're coming up to the Advent season, which precedes Christmas. During the four Sundays of Advent, we look to the anticipation of Jesus for his second coming and, his first co- and also to acknowledge his first coming. Well, this passage looks towards Jesus' second coming, per se, But it also looks at what life in Jesus is for us today. We are after-the-fact people when you think about it. That is, we are people who receive the grace of God through Jesus because of his coming over 2,000 years ago, which we'll remember at Christmas. And we've been touched already by the kingdom of God. We live in it, however imperfectly. So theologians will call us the people of the already, but not yet. You've heard those terms, I'm sure. But you know what? There's this elephant in the room. Now, there's no elephant here, okay? (laughs) There isn't an elephant here. But you know the expression, the elephant in the room is this. We're people of the kingdom, but when we look around us, we see what? Chaos, confusion. Let's just say what it is. The world is a mess. Now, many of you in this room and some of you not in this room have grown up in what I would call the first World War II Canada. If you've lived in Canada all your life, our reality is is that we've lived in relative peace for almost 78 years, almost 80 years. Almost, I would say, three generations of people who have raised, born and raised here have lived in this era of peace. And that's pretty good. And yet, every once in a while, even the semblance of peace in our lives, we're disturbed, aren't we? We're disturbed. And then, again, sometimes our worldview, and I'm speaking from a Canadian now, someone born here, is not the worldview or the experience of others. And we have people in this room today who have a different experience than my experience. 
But even within Canada, we have our stories of a different experience. A few weeks ago, or two weeks ago, I was in Halifax, and I was attending the Canadian Association to End Homelessness, their conference, their annual conference in Halifax. And one of the side trips I got to take was to Africville. Maybe some of you know about the story about Africville and Halifax. It is the place where Africans from the Caribbean, from Africa, settled. Most of them came through the United States. From the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, loyalists or fleeing, fleeing slavery in the U.S., they ended up in this community on the shores of the harbor in, in Halifax. Some of them hadn't even been there before because they came in with the British and built the fort that Cornwallis built in Halifax. They weren't slaves, they were servants at that time, they said. But living in this area, they were forced to live in poverty. And in, <clears throat> it was just, it's bizarre, the story. They don't live there anymore. And the, the story is that they never got water. They never got sewer. They never had electricity because the Hal city of Halifax refused to service them. They became a very strong community. And in the 19, early 1960s, the city of Halifax came in and said, we want to bulldoze on your house and make a park here. And they said, no, we like living here. We have community here. Well, they didn't listen to the residents there. And the other thing that they had done is they'd put the garbage dump right beside their, their land. So now they're in a legal process of trying to regain the land so they can live there. But we know all the stories, right? I acknowledge today that we are on Treaty 6 territory, and we know the stories about the other Canada that maybe you never had to live in. Then we live in, we, we hear the stories of poverty, the cost of living. Bob kind of mentioned it a little bit in the offertory. We see division in our society in this country and other places. And then we see the tragedy of migration. More people are moving around on this earth than ever before forced out of their homes through war, through poverty, through disease. You know, it sounds like <laughs> the four horsemen in the apocalypse, but it's happening. The, even the idea of lack of opportunity where they live. And then, let alone that, what is happening in the Ukraine or the Middle East? And so here I was going to this conference in Halifax and other conferences this year, and I saw time and time again the plight of people who live even in this country with addictions, poverty, lack of opportunity, lack of affordable housing. And in all this stuff, this one, these two words kept popping into my brain. Disposable people. Disposable people. You know, we read in Genesis when our first parents made this choice to be their own God, to walk away from relationship with our Creator. They doomed us all to one thing. They doomed us all to become disposable. They set us on this course of where our only hope was in the here and now, or by what we can accomplish on our own. And you know, we have billionaires in this world now who are building spaceships and they're helping out NASA to launch people to Mars and that. But when you talk to Mr. Musk, the reason why he's doing this is because we've made such a mess here. He figures we can colonize Mars or some other planet. But you know who's going to get on that spaceship? It's not you or me. It's his buddies, the ones that can pay to go. He's become his own god. Why? Because all the rest of us are disposable. Now, some are more disposable than others because that's the world we live in. You think about the crisis in the Middle East, and I can blame this side and I can blame that side, but overall, you see the suffering and you think, they're all disposable, depending on what side of the fence you're on. They consider the other group disposable. 
Or we can look at the many other conflicts in the world. You know, some of our brothers and sisters here are from Africa. There's a reason why they're here and not at home. Because somewhere along the line, they became disposable too. So I'm often asked, thinking about the world we live in, if I believe that we as Christians are living in what we call the end times. And I always say yes. I believe we're in the end times. Peter told us so in the sermon in Acts 2. When we read in Acts 2 verse 14, you know the story about Acts 2, the coming of the Holy Spirit. People start speaking in other languages. The question is asked by the crowd, what's going on here? What's going on? And Peter answers them. He says, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. You know, and even in Ontario, the liquor stores usually don't open until noon, but maybe they open earlier here. I'm not sure. No, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. We talked a little bit about dreaming dreams yesterday in our meetings. So the answer may be, okay, but things must be getting much more worse, don't you think? And what should we do? What should we do? And I've come to answer that question with this, with another question. How will knowing that this is the present age, the end, maybe we've got 20 years to go or 30 years to go, change your life? Now, I know we all like to live around, be in a state where we know what's happening around the corner. Wouldn't we just love that? Wouldn't we just love to know what our life is going to be like in a week, a two years, three years? Wouldn't we like to be able to predict the future? It's kind of like that movie, Back to the Future. Now I'm really showing my age because I think there's like, those were like 25 years, 30 years ago. But there's that one Back to the Future episode where uh, the, the, the descendant of Biff gets a hold of, uh, of the uh, scores and everything for a year of all the sports and somehow he's able to translate it back into time so that his ancestor makes a, big, big, a lot of money on sports betting, which, you know is big in our, in our society today. So he had the inside track and you can make all sorts of money doing this. And maybe we think with this knowledge we can prepare. Maybe we'd be better at preparing. How many people do you know that are digging that shelter in their backyard and storing up food? I know somebody that's done that. Waiting for what we jokingly call the zombie apocalypse. I had an aunt and uncle who were really tied in with end time at one time. I think they belonged to, the, uh, to a group and, and they were promoting the end time. And so what they did was they stored up all this food. They lived on a farm and they stored up all their food and put it in jars and put it up in the attic. And one day my aunt was up there cleaning around and she noticed the weevils had got into the wheat and into the rice and everything had spoiled and she asked my Uncle Bill, she says, what are we going to do now? And Uncle Bill looked at her and he said, you know, maybe this is a lesson for us. Maybe this is not what we're supposed to do. And he said, you know, when you're, I was thinking about it the other day, and he said, you know, we may have food. And everyone out there is shooting themselves and robbing and doing all sorts of stuff. And we're okay at home eating this food. And when everyone's getting thinner and thinner and thinner, and they look at us and say, they must have a stash somewhere. And he said, they'll just come and take it. They'll just take it from us. So they gave up on that. Your neighbors will know, he says. And if an invading army comes, they'll find you eventually. So even with hidden knowledge or a timeline, whatever you have, you are still left with how we're going to live today and tomorrow. And so what does Jesus say that our lives will look like? Well, Back to that passage in Matthew 25 that Betty read. Why do his followers do the things they do? They're amazed, aren't they? Remember, they were amazed. When did we do this? When did we do this, Jesus? And he answers them, you know. You just did it. 
And then he goes after the goats a little bit and says, you know, weren't you aware? Weren't you aware? But why did his followers do this? This is the question I have. Think about it again. The question I've asked is, so what if you knew? Or what if you don't know? What does it change your life? What is follow, why his followers did that was because they were living out the life in the life of the king. It had become, as our, my lectionary study group talked about this week, it became the part of their DNA. We use that a lot. And I have a f- friend here that is into DNA studies, you know? The scientist guy here. They were no longer, they no longer looked at others and considered them disposable. They saw the value of every human being. That at the beginning, all human beings were created in God's image. And that Jesus came to reconcile all humanity, not just you, not just me, but all humanity to the triune God. That's why, in addition to the job I do for the church, that's why I'm still involved with working to end poverty and homelessness. I sit on a committee in Saskatchewan where we get money from the federal government. We work with the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan. They get applications from homeless shelters and different things. And we're the ones that have to decide who gets what. And during COVID, it was really exciting. We gave away $6 million, two of us, because we didn't want to have meetings every week. So they just made the two board chairs. One of them, I was one and one, and I was the rural and remote board chair. And another lady was the Indigenous board chair, and we sat down and we worked through this with with Service Canada, and we gave away $6 million. And one of the things we tried not to do was just have money go out for something today. We built infrastructure at the same time. We were able to tweak that a bit, because that was our goal, because we don't get $6 million anymore. But we use it as an opportunity to help people. I'm under, under no illusions that the, all these problems will be solved by humans or even by the church. You know, look at the state of the church. And, and Keith and I have a fellow uh, professor from Regent College who has now fallen from favor because of some of the things he's done in his life. So the church isn't the answer. In, in, the human church is not the answer, right? Because we are failed human beings. We're all whether we like to acknowledge it or not, we're all affected by that decision so long ago that we read about in the book of Genesis. We're all affected by this decision that it's all about me. We're all affected by the selfishness and individualism in our society, wherever you come from. Let's call it sin that taints us all. And if anything, history has taught me There are no human saviors. I don't think Jesus was under that illusion at all. Why would he come if there were no if there were human savers? But I'm still involved in these things because I know I can make a difference in someone else's life. I really do. And I've I've seen the results of some of the granting money that we've given to, to these organizations and Some people's lives are turned around. At least they're not living on the street. At least they're not living on the street. And getting to know my neighbors, perhaps, I can be that light that Jesus wants to shed in their lives. You know, I deal with my Ken Ken and Kathy across the street. They have their issues. And the other day, Ken said something really interesting to me. He said, he looked at me in the eye and he said, Bill, now, of course, this is going to be after the fact, but he said, I'd like you to say something about me when I'm gone. That's the first time Ken has ever said that to me. That's why we had the discussion yesterday, right? We, we looked at it and we said, okay, well, you're in a new place. You're in this new community. Is there a role for you to play to show people that there is light from the kingdom? To show people that they are valued and loved by God. To show people that they're not disposable. And sometimes we really have to watch ourselves because we do put people in the disposable category. And I, what I saw yesterday and the conversations you'll have in the future is it'll probably mean taking an inventory 
and trying different things. Trying different things. Lindsay Armstrong, in writing on this passage, makes some important points. But I'd like to read some of her comments. She said, It's easy to read this passage and miss the gospel. As we watch the sheep and the goats being separated for eternity, and the one thing I like about this room is everyone's sitting in the middle, so I can't go sheep and goats because you're all in front of me, most of you. The other sheep and the goats, well, it's okay. But as we watch the sheep and goats being separated for eternity, we may see and preach little more than the humanitarian call for work on behalf of society's undervalued members. You can take that approach. But she said, subsequently, salvation is understood in what we re- achieve. And we've got to be really careful with this passage because we can turn it into another thing we have to do. But instead, she says, this scripture testifies that salvation is something we discover. Often when we least expect it. Those sheep did not know what they were doing. They didn't know the ramifications of it, did they? They were totally shocked, just like the goats. She says in Matthew 25, verses 37 through 39, the righteous are surprised to realize that they had cared for the king of creation. Evidently, they simply shared who they were and what they had freely without calculation or expectation. Or as I said before, it was just part of who they were as followers of Jesus Christ. And then in verse 44, the unrighteous are shocked that they had missed opportunities to share the love to the king. Had they known God was in their midst, they would have done the right thing. Of course they would have. Yet the king is looking for something else, she says, for a natural outflowing of love. In other words, the king is looking for that infusion of God's spirit as it comes through you and out into the the world that you live in. Not calculated efforts to design to protect, designed to protect a certain image. This is the kind of love Jesus has come to demonstrate and share. For Jesus, there are no disposable people, are there? And Lizzie Armstrong goes on to say that this passage provides us also with a wellness check. We sort of did a little bit of a wellness check yesterday. How's your heart beating? How's the blood flowing? How are things working for you as a congregation? Lindsay Armstrong goes on to say that this passage provides us with a wellness check, like taking our weight or blood pressure. She continues this. Loving those for whom Jesus gave his life, particularly those who are undervalued, I put in the word disposable, is our primary expression of our love of God and our experience of God's love for us. We may not be not like, warning, like warnings or wellness checks. After, they all, after all, they ask us to recalibrate our lives. Yesterday, we started talking about recalibrating, like your GPS is telling you, recalculating, recalculating, right? When you go off the path of the GPS. However, they provide a critical wellness overview that we are wise to let tend, particularly since heart trouble plagues us all. Yeah, we're all affected by the fall, aren't we? So one of my favorite stories I want to share with you today is that whole thought about who we are. There are there's a story about a, a seminary student who worked as a missionary project or an internship pro- project for one of his classes. I did something similar with Regent, and he had to work in downtown, and he picked a church that was doing a soup kitchen. And it had been a long day, a lot of people had come, it was hot, and it was just, they struggled, you know, people that were smelly, people that were hungry, people that had problems. And it, was, it had been a long day, he'd been there all day, he'd probably stayed up last night writing a paper, and he got the chance to close these big wooden doors. You can imagine one of those big cathedrals downtown, they have these big wooden doors, and they had the, the the soup kitchen in the basement. So he's getting ready. He's kind of hauling that door back. And he's just going to go home, have a nap. And out of the, just down, down the street, he saw this rather disheveled person struggling 
to get down the street and hobbling down there. And he goes, and he knew why he was coming. He was coming for a meal. You know, they had kind of cleaned everything up, but he hadn't quite make the time. And as he's closing that door and he's looking at this individual, he kind of stops. And he says, under his breath, Jesus Christ. To which the old Jesuit mentor of his turned to him and said, could be, son. Could be. So I'd like to end with an encouraging word from Paul. Psalm 100, Matthew 25, and this one is Ephesians 1 through 15 through 23, which is read on Christ the King Sunday. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all peoples, God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. Read this spoken to you. Remembering you in my prayers, I keep asking that God, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, would give you the spirit of seeing people not as disposable, but as valuable, so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in his heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come, that God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills everything and every way. That is Christ our King. That is the one who changes our DNA. To look at others is not disposable, but as future children of God. So in closing, I wanted to read this from Greg Williams' latest editorial in the GCI update. Maybe some of you read it. He says, we are fast approaching the end of the liturgical year. That is, this Sunday, November 26th, is Christ the King Sunday, which marks the end of an ordinary time and ushers in the Advent season. We celebrate Christ's messianic kingship and sovereign rule over all creation. The meaning of the celebration can be summed up in this collective prayer, which I'll read and pray at the same time. Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things in your well-beloved Son, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Mercifully grant that the peoples of this earth, divided and enslaved by sin, may be freed and brought together under his most gracious rule, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And that's our prayer for each and every one of us. That's our prayer for our world. Amen.